Welcome to the weekend here at Somerville Baptist on this special day to celebrate all the moms and your impact on our lives. We have a special gift in the main lobby for all the mothers as you leave today. Thank you for the many sacrifices you make. If you are a first time guest today, we want to thank you for coming and want to get to know you better. We also want to give you a brand new book packed with full incredible testimonies of hope from people right here at Somerville Baptist. This is just a way of saying thank you for being our guest today. Just take your Somerville Connect card from the back of the chair, fill it out, and bring it to the Welcome Center in the main lobby. Members, we also invite you to fill out a card to share prayer requests, ask questions, or update your information. We also would love for any guests or new members to plan to attend a Starting Points class that Pastor will be leading each Sunday in the month of June at 9 a.m. during the Life Group Hour. This class will give you much more information about the church. You can sign up today at the bulletin board in the main lobby. Growth groups are coming back on Wednesday evenings beginning June 7th and going through August the 9th. There will be a special program for the children in the Family Life Center, a youth service for the teens in the youth building, and different classes offered for the adults. Please go by the sign-up sheet in the main lobby to sign up for the group that you would like to attend so that the teachers can be prepared with any materials. You may also sign by writing your name and the class on a connect card and putting it in the offering plate. A list of groups can be found in your bulletin and on the website. Today, there is a bridal table in the main lobby for Annabeth Rachie. Please be a blessing to her and Grant as they begin their new season of life together. Also, ladies, mark your calendar for Ladies Enrichment Retreat here at the church on July 28th through the 29th. Early cost is just $30 if registered by July the 1st. If you are not already connected to a life group, we really encourage you to pick up a list of groups at the Welcome Center and find one to get involved in. These groups are for all ages and meet each Sunday at 9 a.m. before the 10 o'clock worship service. This will be a group of people that you will get to know in a better way. These small groups study the Word of God together, serve and fellowship together, and pray faithfully for one another. Also, if you are interested in being part of ministry full-time or part-time, our preschool is presently hiring. Contact the Dean Matthews or the church office for details. And don't miss our follow-up visitation called Highways and Hedges this Thursday, May the 18th. Dinner will be served in the great room anytime from 5.30 to 6.20, and then we will go out to make some business. Mark your calendar now for Vacation Bible School and the Color Clash Teen Competition and Revival that starts on Monday, June the 5th. Vacation Bible School will be in the mornings that week from 9 a.m. until noon, and the teens will meet each evening from 6 to 8.30 p.m. See your bulletin for more details. Also, it is not too late to sponsor or purchase the new Hope Books. See the Welcome Center or call the church office for details. Thank you for praying for the War Teen Meeting this past week. God did some amazing things with many teenagers being saved. Please continue to pray now for their spiritual growth. Again, thank you for being a part of this special weekend. Now let's lift our voices in worship and open our hearts to the Word of God.
Amen. Let's stand together this evening, sing together. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is with me, whatever they may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's all. started pastoring, let me tell you, I'll tell you one of the worst mistakes I ever made. And uh, the church I pastored did not have a Sunday night service up in Michigan. So we were going to start a Sunday night service. Here's where it goes wrong. The very first night that we started our Sunday night service, do you know what Sunday it was? It was Mother's Day Sunday. I can remember three minutes before the service started going in the back classroom and praying God, please let somebody show up. And they did. It was me and my wife and our one child and then a family of four people and my in-laws for Mother's Day. And we had a forgettable service. So I'm glad you're here tonight. We're down to the faithful few on Mother's Night. And that's, that's Mother's Day night. That's typical. I'm glad you're very faithful. But we're here to hear from God tonight. Choir did a fantastic job. We're going to take a few minutes to greet each other. And then uh, we'll come back and sing again in just a moment. So let's do that, and we'll look forward to being in the Word of God. In just a little later in service, we're going to have a time of testimony. God's done some great things over the past few days. And so we're going to take some time to do that tonight. So be ready for that, if you will, please. Right now, we want to take just a moment to welcome you to the service at Somerville Baptist Church. As we're singing the hymns, as we're going through the worship time, which leads ultimately to worshiping him through the receiving of the word, we want to make sure that you that are watching by live stream know that you're an integral part of what's happening today. So we want to encourage you to have your Bible ready, be praying about what God's trying to say to you, and be looking for God to speak to you. We value you watching it by live stream, but I will tell you, it'll never be a replacement you coming and being a part of our service for real so we want to invite you to come and find a time to say I'm going to be a guest at Somerville Baptist Church but in the meantime right now while you're watching we want to welcome you we want to say it's our privilege to have you being a part of the Somerville family today so let's listen to what God's going to say to us right now
so Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good.
before Charity comes and sings, we want to take a few moments to uh, be able, she's not singing? Okay. But we want to take a few minutes for testimonies then. Somebody would like to share a word of testimony, a word of praise? Who would like to start us tonight with that? Things God has done. Somerville Baptist Church has a lot to praise the Lord for over the past few days. Well, this past week at the war, um, Jackson went over to my neighbor's house and invited two of our neighbors that uh, came to the war, and I'll let him share the rest of that story. But one of the one of the friends got um, saved. One, both of the friends got saved, but one of them, I was, we were really burdened for. We had me and Jackson were playing basketball the other day with him, and I talked to him about the gospel, but he never really opened up about it. He had some more questions about what he wanted to do with his life and uh, if he was a Christian. So. He came out to the war, and then after the war, I, I was talking to him for a little bit after Jackson had already went inside, and then the other buddy had already gone home. And I was asking him about discipleship and how much it was important um, to our church and how much um, people are in it going through it right now. So I asked him about discipleship and asked him if he would like to go through it um, since he's a new Christian and he would, um, if he wanted to know more about the gospel. And he, he said, I'm down, so when can we start? Can we start sooner? than nor-? And I asked him if we wanted to start Actually, we're starting this Tuesday, but he wanted to know if we could do it sooner, but we had it, uh, he didn't, he wasn't able to come to church today, so um, just pray for that, and um, thank the Lord that I got an opportunity to do, to do that, so I'm able to disciple two people right now. Praise the Lord for that. Someone else tonight? Word of praise, testimony? Uh, for me, I would just say this past semester, um, even just going back to college, it seems like every time there's just, you know, how, how am I going to pay for this? And uh, and I was able to get through uh, this semester just by God's grace, really, and his provision. And so I praise the Lord for that, even just working uh, really recently in a miraculous way. And I know um, just as a recent testimony, uh, this past semester, I've really... Uh, just tried to get plugged into what we have as Christian services. And uh, this one I want to do uh, just specifically because I wanted this to be something that I make a habit and that's soul winning. And so I went on the men's door-to-door uh, every week this past semester. And I just wanted to praise the Lord uh, that I was able to lead five, five people to the Lord. And even just recently, the last uh, Saturday that we went, um, it, it was just is just one of those things where, you know, we were running into some just some weird people, and it just it was hot outside, and we were just really tired. And I remember the last house we went to. Um, it was a young man, um, probably about 15, and this was just uh, I think two weeks ago, or maybe even just one week ago, um, that this young man he was just st- standing out in his yard, and we were able to um, I was able to lead him to the Lord, and then he asked me if I could bring him a Bible, and so we were able to do that. So I just wanted to praise the Lord uh, just for that and uh, just the heart of uh, just, just reaching souls. I'm really glad to be back as well, and uh, just to see the heart of my church that has that heart as well. You know what's amazing about that, Jordan, is that's probably what the people were saying when you left their house, and that was one weird dude. <laughs> Jordan's going up to pray for Jordan. In a few weeks, he's going, two weeks, he's going up to work with Steve Chevron. Whitney is here tonight. She's here for the entire month. And uh, then Jordan's going up with Steve and Whitney when they head back to Vermont to be an intern this summer. And that's part of our internship program out of Somerville Baptist, and we're excited about that. Steve Chevron and Jordan Dodd together. Vermont will never be the same. And then Matthew Clark, Matthew, raise your hand so everybody can. Matthew is going to be starting Tuesday as an intern here at Somerville Baptist for the summer. And so we're looking forward to putting him to work and what God's going to do through him over this summer. Someone else tonight, a word of testimony and praise. Whitney? I would say, of course, there's been a lot of lessons over the last um, two years that we've been up there that God is um, growing us and helping us learn. But um, 
I would say that something that the Lord really convicted me of was um, how I um, sometimes can make snap judgments about people before I really get to know them. And um, especially like Vermont, the culture is so different from here, and people really just don't have a clue. And um, they just, they it's such a dark place, and it really needs the light. Um, but uh, the Lord had given me an opportunity to get to know someone um, who I'm pretty sure um, does not know the Lord. And um, through that, he's really shown me... Um, to get out of my comfort zone and um, get around lost people and befriend them. And, um, of course, there's a balance to that, obviously. Um, but, but still, just, just how much went, growing up here, I feel like I a lot of times would only be around just a lot of saved people, and, and, which is awesome. But still, you know, how am I fulfilling the Great Commission if I don't go get out of my comfort zone and meet these people and stop making snap judgments about them because they look differently or, you know, whatever. Um, but just to love them to Jesus right where they are, no matter what they look like or anything like that, because really people really don't know. Even down here, there's people that really don't have a clue about the gospel and Jesus and what he did. But especially where we are um, they, they have no idea. Um, I was talking to one of my friends, the friend I was talking about, she, we were talking about, um, Samuel and Hannah and, um, Hannah praying for a child. And she was like, that's a really beautiful story. I've never heard that. And she, she was a member of a Catholic church, I believe, or whatever, but, um, just people just don't know. And the Lord really opened my eyes to that this past couple of years that we've been there just to share and love them to Jesus more. Anyone else tonight? Jared? Um, one of the um, most important people in my life, my cousin Blake, and um, all through our lives, we always just play video games and stuff. But um, after I accepted Christ when I was 11, I've always felt the concern that when I die and when he dies, I might not see him in heaven. And um, I went, I um, chaperone, uh, chaperoned the Cornerstone group to their nationals this year. When the preacher was there, he challenged us within three months, talk to somebody who you might not think know Christ. And I tried to do that. And um, on my birthday, after me and my cousin went to do something fun, I just, I really felt the burden in my heart to talk to him and ask him. And um, today, thankfully, he accepted Christ as a savior today. Today? So, today, yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. I love Jared Henry. He's a very slow driver, though. <clears throat> One morning I passed him going about 20 miles an hour faster down 565, and he was in the left lane and wouldn't get out of my way. And I didn't know it was Jared, so I'm glad he loves me, too. Somebody else tonight? I'd like to thank God that... Um even though we're full of doubt, he's still God. He's still going to prove that he is God, no matter what we might think about a certain situation. This past week with the war, um, I was sitting there talking to Pastor Rick, and I'm ashamed about it now. But I'm like, there's no way people are coming to this. Like, spring training starting for football Monday night, and, you know, awards banquets are going on for school everywhere. There's tons of events. And first night I almost was in tears by the end of it because God blew me away I mean, we had over 100 the first night and they just kept getting bigger from the nights on and then hearing 36 people getting saved it, I mean it's just amazing that's now 50 over 50 people that have been affected directly by our youth group and coming to Christ and I'm just so thankful for our youth group and how on fire it is for God the other day we're on teen ignite and uh Pastor Ricky says, let's, let's just put them on the doors. We've got to get as much of these war material out as we can. And Jackson leans over to me and says, y'all can put them on the doors, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Pastor Ricky, he says, well, you, if, if you're going to leave somebody to Christ, I can't argue with you. And Jackson says, okay, watch me. And <laughs> he goes and knocks on the door, and he gets back in the van, and him and I guess, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Dylan or somebody. But um, they had led somebody to Christ. And so I just, I, I love our youth group and how they don't take no for an answer. They're going to be a witness. They're going to be a light and get out of their comfort zone and 
tell people about Jesus, and God's using us in a big way. And so uh, just keep praying for our youth group. Um, change is coming. There's new leaders rising up. And I just pray that God just does something more amazing than we've ever seen with our youth group. So thank you. You know, I think we need to stop um, right now. I'm going to I'm gonna ask uh, Gary, why don't you come on up here, would you? Yeah. Gary, Bracey. And then uh, Matt Teague. Matt, would you come up? Matt's home. Does he look smarter to you? He's got a paper to say he is. Just graduated from college. He's going to be traveling for Pensacola Christian as a rep. Uh, let's, let's just stop. You know, last um, week we took a lot of time to pray, and God answered that prayer. Tonight I think it's important that we acknowledge that God answered our prayer with seeing so many young people saved. And then pray, thank him for that, let's praise him for that, but then let's pray now for the follow-up because that's the key. And let's pray that God will give us the boldness, the uh, discipline to do the follow-up on that and to see these young people uh, be grown, discipled, baptized, become part of the church, and in turn to reach others for Christ. So let's just take a little bit to thank God for what he's done over the past week. If you two men would lead us. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, I thank you, Father, for everything that you've done, not just this last week, Father, but just this, this year during the school year, Father, with these teens, God, and to see, to see them have a burden for other souls, Father. Pray, Father, that you just you strengthen each one of them, God. That that every day that goes by, that they become stronger in you. That that they don't forget about the ones that they've talked to, and they just don't become a, a number to them, God. That they stay as a burden. That you keep them right there, close to their hearts, God, and close right on the top of their minds, Lord. And that they would would strive to reach out to them, Father, and and walk walk with them, God, because it's as a new Christian, Father, I remember what it was like and I remember not having anyone that walked with me, God, and, and, and tried to show me how to do certain things and and I'm so grateful to see these teens, God, being led by you down paths of workmanship for you, God. That only, they just want to see the kingdom further, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you just be with Pastor Ricky and, and Miss Christy, God, as, as they work with the teens, and that uh, that you would strengthen Pastor Ricky and, and lead him in the direction that you would have him, Father. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity that I have to be able to witness and to be a part of these teens, God, and they're such a blessing to me. They have no idea, Lord, that, that that how you strengthen me through them, God, daily and make me want to strive to do better, Father. And I pray, Father, for all of the teens that got saved this week at the war, Lord, and, and I thank you for those souls, God. I thank you for those souls that, that have the opportunity to now further the kingdom for you even more, God. And I pray that we will strive, Father, to to be better, Father. Just that we would strive to spend more time in your word, Father, and that we would wholeheartedly quit trying to live the way that we think we should and start trying to live the way that you want us to live, Father. In Christ's name.
Lord, uh, we thank you for this night that we've been able to come to your house, Lord, and just um, hear testimonies, Lord, of what you've done in people's lives. Um, God, you know, I've, I've been in, haven't been here the past few years, Lord, but I've been able to see um, through various networks, Lord, and testimonies that what you've been doing here, Lord, um, while you've been working down at school and other places in Vermont as well, Lord. But um, I thank you for our, the heart of our youth group. Uh, the video that they posted a few months ago or a month or two ago, Lord, just how excited they are to spread the gospel, Lord. They're not indifferent about what they have. They have what other people need, and they go out, and they spread it. They're not ashamed of it, Lord. And I thank you for that attitude, that spirit. It's convicting in my life um, to see people who are just unashamed of the gospel, Lord, and um, convicting me of how much am I doing as well. And I, I thank you for uh, Charity, Lord, my little sister being a part of it as well, and just seeing her heart uh, just for people, Lord, that you've given her. And uh, as Christian said, you know, Lord, it's funny how whenever we think that something couldn't happen, Lord, um, that's when you show us how big and powerful you really are. When, other th- when everything's going all, all around us, our, our busyness and all the hustle and bustle of life, Lord, as Pastor said, hope nobody has to throw a brick at us, or you don't have to throw a brick at us to get our attention. Lord, that when, when li- something is little, Lord, you are much, and how you can make something so small into something so big. And 36 teens, Lord, 36 young people coming to know you as their personal Savior, what a blessing that is, and what a praise that is that we can, um, that we can be a part of it, Lord, just have something... Um, have a small part in your big plan that you have. You already promised the victory to us, Lord. All we have to do is take part of it and go out and tell people. And, Lord, the gospel doesn't have to change. It never has. It never will. All we have to do is go and proclaim it to us, to, to, to this lost and dying world, Lord. Um, I, I thank you for even being, um, for um, choosing us, Lord, that um, to calling us to spread your gospel, Lord, how much of a privilege it is. And I pray that we do look at it as a, as a privilege every morning that when we wake up, we have the chance to tell somebody else about you. And Lord, I pray for these 36 young people that have been saved. And, uh, the, as Jackson led somebody else to the Lord, Tina Knight, all the past um, month or two of people coming to know you, Lord, as their personal Savior. I pray that as we um, can connect with them, Lord, disciple them and grow them, um, and they can follow you in believer's baptism, and they can come to a church that loves them, that loves God, and Lord, just wants to serve you with their life, and they just get plugged in and to see even more magical and amazing things happen through you. Lord, we thank you for your power, your strength, and as Jordan said, your provision in our life. But more importantly, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that you sent to die on the cross for our sins, that we are nothing without you. Lord, with you, we have everything. And I've said it before, Lord, we can have everything, but if we don't have you, we're nothing. But if we lose everything, if our house burns down, we lose all of our material possessions and everything, Lord, but we have that personal relationship with you. We have everything we've ever needed. Lord, we just thank you so much for what you've done here in this church the past in my life, Lord, that I've seen in the present, Lord, and I can't wait to see what you're going to do in the future. And uh, just have your hand upon this church as you always have. And Lord, I pray that we're not just a church in between these walls, but we're also the church outside the walls. Lord, just keep working, keep your hand upon Pastor Nye as he brings your word, hide him behind the cross, fill him with your spirit, and help us to get something from your word tonight and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We have a couple of special treats tonight. Uh, this is our annual uh, opportunity to hear Miss Vida sing. She asked even this afternoon for her Mother's Day. So if we can get the microphone to Miss Vida, she's going to sing for us. This is something we do if you're guests with us. Um, we're still just a Somerville family. We're just, somebody once asked Jason Jenkins about Somerville Baptist and how it's grown. And he says, well, we're just a small church with a lot of people. And that's where we are. So, Ms. Fight, please. Uh, Brother Shane, I witnessed this afternoon. I went to my son's house, and I got to witness to about five ladies there, and I sang the song over there. And yesterday, all day, that was my goal to do a Mother's Day song to each widow that I called that was at home or it ain't true. And I sang to them yesterday. I've got my blessings, but it's only God that does this through me. And I want all of you to be encouraged to live a Christian life that you can move for God any way that he shows you. I only call people when God shows me to, not when I want to. And it makes a difference. So I'll sing out a song that I wrote when I was a little girl walking to school. Never thought I'd ever be 
we'll have to sing it anyway. She labored so hard in this world below. She didn't have things as most mothers know. Raising her children from an offering small pay, ironing and washing since dad passed away. I want to go to heaven when this life is o'er. I want to be with Jesus on eternity shore. But when there's a crown given, when the time rolls around, please, blessed Jesus, give mother my crown. Please, blessed Jesus, give mother my crown. Thank you, Ms. Fida. And the wonderful part of that is even when the crowns are given, we'll all throw them back at his feet. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Bob Vallier is here to help us with the in-house audit. He's been here for the past few days. He and Special Treat having his wife with us. And I want to encourage you, if you've not yet signed up for the financial uh, counseling and you want to do that, I know several have, you can sign up still at the Welcome Center after the service just for tomorrow. I think there's a couple of openings still left for that. But it's been a privilege to have Dr. Valley. He's a very good friend of our ministry, a very good friend of the local church and of me personally. And it's a privilege to have them here. So tonight, before we go to the message, Mrs. Valier is going to bring a special in song. Oh, 
Thank you for that. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 15, please. 1 Samuel chapter 15. In 1 Samuel 15, God's given the command to Saul in the battle with the Amalekites to completely destroy them. And he says to utterly, the word is used, utterly to destroy them. That means uh, it was the entire population, it was the animals, and that was his command. Well, Saul, <clears throat> uh, here's the command, and then we know that he has a different response. As a result of the different response that Saul has, other than complete obedience, God in turn has a very clear message given to him through the prophet Samuel. So we're just going to jump through the passage tonight. Here's the setting now of Saul after the battle with the Amalekites, and then the response that comes down um, from God through Samuel. First Samuel chapter 15 and verse 1, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which the Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not that slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. There's your command. It's very clear. There's no, there's no um, uh, ambiguity about the command that he's given here. Jump down to verse 7. And small smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is, over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse that they destroyed utterly. Question. Did Saul completely obey God? Yes or no? No. Jump down to verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I perform the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Jump down to verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, here's the great phrase of this passage, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Verse 26. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Jump down now to verse 35. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Obedience. It's such a simple concept. But for some reason, it's such a difficult task for Christians. We tend to find ourselves explaining it away. We can code it over with spiritual terms and language. But the fact comes down that many times that we refuse to submit ourselves to the commands of God and or to those that have been placed as authorities over us. And we couch it in nice spiritual terms. But the fact comes down that it's disobedience. And incomplete obedience in the eyes of God is disobedience. It doesn't matter if you're trying to, con um, to accomplish spiritual things or somehow you're making up for because you don't agree with what's taking place. For God, that's not really the question. The question is, are you going to obey me or are you not? 
And by the way, spiritualized disobedience is still rebellion in the eyes of God. He said, here's the command, here's the expectation. Same, and Saul said, well, we were going to save them for something better. We were going to save it for something more spiritual. God said, that wasn't what I asked of you. That wasn't what I told you. That wasn't what I commanded you to do. I command you to just be simply obedient to me. And I do view that as rebellion. He says rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. What does that mean? That means we're putting self in the place of God. Idolatry, that's putting self or some other figure in the place of God. Rebellion is the issue. It's not a, a wooden idol. It's not a stone idol. It's a self idol. I know better. I know better than the authorities God's placed in my life. So I can do what I want to when I want to do it. How I want to do it. And you're going to expect God to bless that? No. Fact is, when it's your turn, then don't do it that way. Learn the lessons. You may even disagree with it while those lessons are put upon you, those responsibilities, those expectations. That's perfectly understandable. Nobody, I don't think, expects you to agree with everything. But if you've placed yourself underneath, as the scripture says in Romans 13, God-ordained authority in your life, then those authorities being ordained of God is a picture of really, no matter what theological language we use, no matter what spiritual terms we use, it's rebellion. It's rebellion. As long as you're underneath that authority. This is incredibly important because I believe that uh, some have fooled themselves into saying, I want to be used greatly by God. Well, I will say this. God works primarily and almost exclusively through holy vessels. He's not going to work through an impure vessel. Well, pastor, are you dismissing grace? No, I'm not dismissing grace at all. In fact, I'll be very clear with you. The grace is a great part of obedience. In fact, grace is necess- it's the necessity for the life of obedience. I'd like to point out just three things tonight. First, I'd like to point out to you the freedom of obedience. You'll not see the outline on the screen, so I'd encourage you to take notes by hand. The freedom of obedience is this. Obedience keeps our relationship with the Lord open and free. The Garden of Eden is a perfect example of this. In Genesis chapter 3, the command was, I want you to think about something. If you think, well, here's my problem. The problem is what the expectations are of me are just unreasonable. What the expectations are, it's just overbearing. It's too much of a, it's too burdensome. Wait a minute. You have an entire garden of every kind of fruit, of every kind of uh, of every kind of blossom, of every kind of nut, of every kind. You have everything here that's available to mankind. And you know what he can't handle? Don't think for a second. I've, I've, if you hold on to total depravity, then listen to what I'm saying. They had one tree, one, out of this entire garden. And you know what the problem was? The problem was not that the commandment was burdensome. The problem was it was a commandment. The problem with Adam and Eve is that they just didn't like being told no. Now, how is that our problem? Well, we are born of the seed of Adam. That same sinful nature. When you sit down and talk with most people, the issue is not that that what God asks of us, what God wants us to do in our life, that it's too burdensome. His grace enables us to accomplish it. The problem that you run into, if you dig into it just a little deeper and get away from these couching spiritual terms, I just don't like being told what to do. That, that's really basically what it comes down to. Obedience keeps our relationship with the Lord open and free. Freedom that we have in Christ, this liberty we have in Christ, is not doing all that we want to do in the flesh. Freedom, liberty in Christ, is knowing what not to do and not doing it through His grace. That's the freedom of the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ. It's finally being able to live this life by his strength, through his spirit. Obeying God, even when we don't understand, is true freedom. Think about this. A lot of times you'll you'll have young guys that will come on staff and you'll be talking with them and helping them to understand, look, you have great freedom by being on, on a staff. There was great freedom for me when I was a youth pastor. There was great freedom for me when I was 
an associate pastor. Here was a freedom. The buck didn't stop at my desk. I didn't have to worry how the bills were going to be paid. I didn't have to worry about the balanced budget. I didn't have to worry about deacons meetings. I didn't have to worry about, I can remember going to Pastor Wallace and saying this. I said, hey, listen, I really, <clears throat> I really would like to be a part of the deacons meetings. You know what his response to me is? I am quoting, you're an idiot. <laughs> that was his quote. Why? Why would you want to do that if you don't have to? You don't have to worry about it. You have very simple tasks. It's, it's very delineated and just be, do those well. Follow through on those. In time, God will, God will open up greater doors and you'll be wishing for the days that you didn't have to go to deacons meetings. I don't wish for those days now. We have a great group of deacons, but there's been times I've wished that. You see, for us, many times, obeying God, even when we don't understand, God's the one who holds the world in place. God is the one by whom all things consist. We just simply have to obey him. There's great freedom in that, that we have the weight. We don't have the weight of the world on our shoulders. We, we like to take it that way. And by the way, those who often are struggling with this, this area of obedience, with this area of submission, often take on greater burdens on themselves. And you'll find them even involved in self-destructive behavior, a lot of times particularly mentally and emotionally, because they're taking on themselves things that they, they should never have taken on. I don't think there's probably a person in here that doesn't believe in the sovereignty of God. I think there's a lot of us that have trouble practicing the sovereignty of God. God's not just sovereign in soteriology. God is sovereign in very basic, practical areas of life. There's great freedom that comes from obeying God. Secondly, I'd like you to see this. Not only is there great freedom in obedience, but secondly, I want you to understand that the challenges that come with obedience. Obedience challenges us to go beyond, as I just said, mere understanding. In the crowd that he had, some of these were experts. When you go to Matthew chapter 5, and I don't want to steal too much from that, verses 17 through 20, these guys were experts in telling other people what to do. The problem was in enacting it themselves. <clears throat> when I was younger, I found that I had all the answers I'm now, I guess many would say, middle-aged. I'm finding out that I have some answers. But the trend is leading me to that by the end of this thing, my personal opinions really have no answers. It comes down to the Word of God. Simply and plainly, the Word of God. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Let, let me be very plain with you. God expects obedience. You can teach and preach grace all you want to, but God expects obedience. And his grace is the enabling part to be obedient to him. The challenge is, is that it causes us, it calls us to go beyond mere understanding. It's much easier to study God's laws and to tell others to obey them than to put it into practice ourselves. Any parent would understand that with a child. It's much easier for me to tell my children what to do than for me to do it. Obedience challenges us to go beyond mere outward conformity. Pharisees were very exacting. They were like scrupulous when it came to following the law. So how in the world could Jesus call us to a greater righteousness than the Pharisees had, which is what he's doing? Now here was the issue. The Pharisees' weakness is that they were content to obey the laws outwardly without allowing God to change their heart attitude. So here's the opposite side. God is calling you to obey him, but he's calling you to obey him as having salvation by grace, not in order to achieve salvation, but out of a heart of love and gratefulness because of salvation and the power that lies inside us because of salvation. And this is very important because we have this kind of, kind of spiritual checklist 
that if we check off, well, we, we went to church Sunday morning. Hey, I went to church Sunday night Mother's Day. Or I did this, or I did this. Well, then that must make me spiritual. No. No, in fact, that could be masking something very unspiritual. It's the motivation. Read 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. And tell me that motivation is not important. Because he says there's a more excellent way, 12 and verse 31 of 1 Corinthians. Going into 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, he says that without charity, a love for what? The love of Christ constraineth me. It's the love of Christ, the love that I have for him. That's why I give. That's why I serve. That's, that's why I would give my body to be burned. That's the faith that flows from me is because of my love that I have for Jesus Christ and his grace that is propelling and compelling me to this. And if it's not because of that, then he says three different times, it is worth nothing. It is nothing, it profiteth me nothing, it means nothing. Our motivation is key in this area of obedience. It's not just that we're obeying, but we get, look, our motivation to obedience. And here's the catch of all that. If our motivation is because of our love of God, then it doesn't matter what authority figure is standing in front of us. The personality becomes irrelevant at that point because what's motivating us to live a life of obedience is our love for God. And if this is where he has me, if this is who he has me with and this is the authority that I'm submit to or this is the area that I am to obey in in this way, well, if, if this is where he has me, then I'm going to submit to it. But I don't agree. Neither did Saul. Don't be so prideful that you're missing the point. Because if you're going to allow God to use you, then let me be very clear. Your refusal to submit to him in seemingly small ways now, you can call it by whatever other authority you want to call it by. The fact is, if you've placed yourself underneath that, then you're calling to submit to that. I don't like my boss. Well, let me give you a key. If that's where the Lord has you, then you're to submit to that authority. Well, I, I don't like if that's where God has you for the time being. You may not ever understand it. You may never understand it until you get to heaven. You may not even understand it when you get to heaven. All you understand is this is where God has me. This is who, what he has me doing, so I'm going to be obedient to them, no, quit making it all about the flesh. To them, all powers of be ordained of God. Obedience challenges us to go beyond mere understanding. It challenges us to go beyond outward conformity. It challenges us to act out of a love for God. And then third and finally, what are the benefits of obedience? In Exodus chapter 15 and verses 26, God gives a statement to the children of Israel. He says in Exodus 15 and verse 26, And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and to keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Well, yeah, but pastor, wait a minute now. We're in the New Testament. This is the new covenant that we're under. I completely agree with you. I would not argue that point in a minute. But many times when we start this kind of discussion, we somehow are buying into this dual nature of God. Let's be very clear about this. God's nature never changes. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in the Old Testament, what you find is you find a big part of the character of God, that he takes holiness very seriously. He takes obedience very seriously. In fact, he takes it so serious that he knew it was impossible for you and I to be obedient to him. So what does he do? He sends his son to die for us. Why? So that his grace can enable us to be obedient. 
Don't cheapen grace by cheapening holiness. Our God is still a thrice holy God. This grace that calls us to salvation and this grace that gives us liberty is the same grace that enables us not to license of sin, but to holiness unto God. That's the grace of God. Obedience, the benefits is obedience, number one, it keeps us from harm. The old um, story goes about in Alaska, the way that they catch a wolf years ago, the Eskimos, is that they would simply take a knife, they would smear some type of white animal, usually a rabbit, they would smear the blood all over the knife. knife. The blood would become frozen. They would stick it, blade up in the ground. The wolf would come, and at first, the wolf felt nothing about the blade. It was just the dry blood that was on the knife. And he kept looking and looking, and what happened is that the blood eventually would start to thaw. And as the blood thawed, then he was ingesting that. But eventually what had happened is he got down to the blade. The trouble was he had been licking on the knife so long that his tongue basically had become numb from the cold, and he realized that the blood that he was tasting, it was no longer the blood that was on the knife, it was his own. And the Eskimos would kill the wolf by him basically dying of his own wound, self-inflicted. You see that a lot of times with people. You'll find them basically self-inflicting destruction. At first, sin tastes good. There's pleasure in sin for a season. But eventually, the destruction that seemed to taste so good at the beginning, the rebellion, the getting away with something, it's no longer now the sin itself. They're literally eating themselves. They're literally imploding, not even realizing what's taking place. You see, the reason God put these commandments into place is so that you and I would not destroy ourselves. This was for our good. It was for our benefit that he put these things into place. Obedience often, it's not always the case, but obedience to God often keeps us from harm. If we want God to care for us, then we need to submit to his directions for living. If we want God to be able to, um, if we want our lives to stay in a place of, we talked about this morning, blessing, for God's protection, then we keep ourselves submitted to him. The pastor, again, are you doing away with grace? No. I'm telling you, it's his grace that's going to enable you to do this. Obedience to God often keeps us from harm. Secondly, obedience to God is pleasing to him. We talked about this last week, Makarios, we, the smile of God. I want to please my God. Well, God is pleased through his son, Jesus Christ, in us. Yes, that is true. But God is also pleased in the obedience of his children. Where do you find that? Let's go to the future, shall we? We're standing before the judgment seat of Christ. What's the one phrase that we often hear in speaking about the judgment seat of Christ? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He gives the parables about the faithful stewards that were given ten and five and one talent. The one who was looked at in a diminishing way was the one who hid his talent, did not invest his talent, did not, was not faithful with the opportunities that God has given him. So when we are obedient to God, when we take advantage of the opportunities he places in front of us, Jared talking about witnessing to his cousin, God is pleased with the obedience of his children. That's why he compares the relationship between uh, you and I with him as a father and a child. We please our father by being obedient to him. The little boy was talking to the girl next door and said, I wonder what my mother would like for Mother's Day. The girl answered, well, you could promise to keep your room clean and orderly. You could go to bed as soon as she tells you. You could, um, you could go help as soon as she calls you. You could brush your teeth after eating. You could quit fighting with your brothers and sisters. And the boy looked at her frustrated and he said, no, 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 I mean something practical. I want to do something great for God. I, I want God to use me in a tremendous way. All right, then. Do what he's told you to do. 
No, 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 I want to do something big for him. By his grace, that's something big. We're in here, I want to do the will of God. I want to know what the will of God is. The will of God is very simple for the believer. You do what's right to do right now. God's not going to entrust you with something great until you're faithful in the small areas. When God tells you something, he's bringing you to a place of decision. Are they going to trust me with this? Are they going to be faithful in this? And in turn, he'll open up greater doors of opportunity, of ministry, of service. Obedience to him is pleasing him. Obedience to God often keeps us from harm. And then finally, obedience to God often leads to peace. Asa, the king, his reign was marked by peace because the scripture says that he was careful to obey the Lord as God. Throughout Chronicles, as you read that in your devotional time, you'll find that this word obedience is often connected with peace. The most miserable person is often the backslidden Christian. If you talk to someone who is going through a time of despair and depression, often one of the feelings that they'll bring up to you is a sense of guilt. Now that's why we preach the grace of God. But I will tell you, self-inflicted guilt is something that we have to deal with. I've heard some say that 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, does not apply to believers. The entire book of 1 John is applying to believers. The whole point, the whole theme of the book of 1 John is that we may have fellowship one with another in God our Father. That's written to believers, the entire book of 1 John. And yet in 1 John 1 and verse 9, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That verse is written to believers. It's not an issue of relationship where we're coming to confession. It's an issue of fellowship for you and me. It's a restoring of the fellowship that we have with our God. Yes, those sins have been forgiven. There's no, no one's going to kick you out of the family because you've been disobedient. You're an adopted child of God. But our disobedience will place barriers of fellowship between us and our God. And we have to deal with that. Many times our loss of peace in our life is due to a lack of obedience in our life. By the way, can I tell you this? God gave us his best. He did not withhold any part of himself. His only son he gave for you and me. And it is our reasonable service to be a living sacrifice back to him. I closed. I was on a mission field. There was a mighty river. True story. That was the object of worship of these people. It was in India. Crocodiles would come and native women would take their precious babies and they would offer them as a sacrifice to their heathen river god. A certain missionary said he saw with his own eyes that here would come mothers wiping tears from their cheeks and taking their little babies and tossing those babies into the jaw of crocodiles. And there's still areas in India that that is practiced. The missionary said he saw a lady come with two infants, one under each arm. One of the babies was beautiful and robust. Its cheeks were rosy and it looked to be in perfect health. The other baby was sickly, skinny, scrawny, it looked like it might have some serious disease and probably wouldn't live very long either way. Its ribs and bones were covered only by flesh. She came to the river to offer one of these infants. The missionary said that he watched carefully to see what she would do. And to his surprise, she reached down and she took the healthy one and threw the child into the river. The missionary, horrified, found her and asked her why she would throw the healthy child in as a sacrifice, keeping the small anemic child who was soon to die anyway. And he said this was her astonishing reply, and I've never forgotten it. With tears in her eyes, her precious baby having just been destroyed by the crocodile, she says, Sir, I don't know what kind of God you have. But my God, little G, deserves the best. I'll say this to you tonight. 
I don't know what type of idolatry you might be practicing tonight that leads to disobedience. But our God, capital G, who gave his very best to us, deserves our very best back to him. Let's stand together tonight. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, here's the invitation. There is that area. Some may know about it. Those closest to you might certainly be aware of it. But there may be some areas that nobody knows about that you know good and well that you've refused to submit. You might have others that you have influence on and you have candy-coated your disobedience. You've called it something other than what it is or it's kind of been something to laugh about and joke around about because you're both comfortable in your disobedience. But you know tonight, the action, even more importantly, the attitudes that lead to the actions are not pleasing to God. So tonight, would you find a place of sacrifice and just simply tonight say, Lord, I know I've been saved. By your grace, I'm saved. But Lord, it's also by your grace that I can live a life sanctified unto you. So Lord, tonight, help me to live in that grace. Lord, I surrender this area. Call it. Name it to him. Lord, I've been disobedient. Please, for sake of fellowship, restore the joy of my salvation. And Lord, tonight, Give me the grace to overcome this. I, I don't want to do this anymore. So tonight, Lord, I surrender this area to you. Christians, let's find a place tonight, a renewed altar of wanting to please our God through obedience supplied by his grace. As the instruments play, let's find a place of sacrifice. Sing just the chorus of the song together. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Tonight we're going to take up this evening's offering. Let's go to God in prayer. Father. We thank you for your grace unto salvation. But Lord, I pray tonight that we'll also walk in the grace unto sanctification. That Lord, our heart will be in such adoration of you, in such love of you. Lord, that we'll be in such a place, as we talked about this morning, being poor in spirit. Acknowledging our spiritual bankruptcy apart from you. That Lord, this grace is not given as liberty unto sin but, Lord, it's given us liberty unto righteousness. And, Lord, we'll submit ourselves to it. There's a part of us, this is not a passive issue. Lord, we have to submit to this. And I pray tonight that we'll do that. Lord, there's those of us who are gossips to the hilt, and we call it discernment. There's those of us who are bitter to the hilt, and we call ourselves standing for truth. There are those of us who are fearful and timid 
and we witness to no one around us, but we find ourselves wanting to get involved of working that off in some other area while those around us that are in the sphere of our own personal mission field we're silent with. Lord, I pray tonight we'll surrender those areas. We're ingesting things by way of entertainment, not just in what we look at, but the time we spend looking at it, that, Lord, we know that we're, we're being disobedient. So I pray tonight, Lord, please, tonight, for your glory, for the kingdom of God's sake, and by your grace, Lord, may we give that to you. In Jesus' name we ask it, amen. You can be seated.